Welcome to Make a Better World, where we connect community activity to community radio. You're listening to Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Ava Vanderstaren, and I'm a guest today on the show, Make a Better World. We're going to be talking about the nonprofit foundation, Innocence Loss Foundation. I'm one of the co-founders of this organization, and also my partner, Fascinate, is here today. Hello. So he's a, the other co-founder. And later on in the show, we're also going to be introducing you to some other guests that we have. Our architects are here to talk more about our project. So today's episode, we're going to be talking about Innocence Lost Foundation. And this is a nonprofit organization that we founded. It's almost becoming a registered charity. We're very close to getting our charity status. And what we do is we want to provide rehabilitation centers for former child soldiers and communities after war. So we want to bring healing to former child soldiers, their communities, and um, just bring awareness to this issue. We've been speaking at schools around the Lower Mainland, and we've been fundraising for a project that we're going to be doing in Sierra Leone. So over the course of the episode, we're going to talk about that, and we're going to educate a little bit about child soldiers as well. So um, I'm not sure how many listeners out there know about child soldiers, but just to give you a little bit of an idea, when we're talking about child soldiers, we're talking about anyone who's under the age of 18 that's being involved in an armed group or force. And around the world, there are actually estimated to be up to 300,000 children fighting. So this can be in many different ways. Um, children can be used on the front lines as soldiers. They can be used as spies, messengers, informants. They can also be used as cooks or servants in the camps, sexual slaves, and they can also be used as human shields or suicide bombers. Fascinating. Do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. Um, um, in, in most of the cases, kids, kids are used as human shield. Um, sometimes um, they place them in situations um, like for example, if a kid is fighting with the militia at a checkpoint, um, the militia will, if they realize they're losing the, the battle, um, they'll place these kids at strategic positions like on a building or on a tree and, um, and tell this kid to protect, um, the front, that line and that they're gonna go get reinforcement and they're gonna come back for them. And most of the time, um, they do that and when they're leaving, they tell the mom, if you, abandon your post, you know what's going to happen, we're going to get you. So most of the time they sacrifice these kids like pawns so uh, most of the militia uh, can get away. Mm -hmm. yeah. And also up to 40% of child soldiers are girls. A lot of people may not know that, but a lot of girls are also used in fighting. And sometimes children are kidnapped and they're forced to fight. And sometimes children's circumstances force them to have to join an armed group. So for example, sometimes a rebel group may come into a town and they may capture all of the kids and force them to kill the parents or kill all of the adults in the community and just take the children. And sometimes kids can be as young as 10 years old or even younger, under 10 um, in some cases. And um, and sometimes a circumstance may be if if child um if a war is going on in their country and they don't have a way to support themselves if they don't have food water or shelter and they don't have a way to take care of themselves they don't have a family to help take care of them they may have to join an armed group or a rebel group or even an army in order to survive in order to be able to just get their day-to-day -day basic needs yeah, cause, um, to add a little bit to that, cause, um, I remember, um, after I was kidnapped for the first time, uh, to join the RAF, um, I escaped, um, within a short period of time. And when I went back uh, to the town where, um, my uncle, who was my guardian at the time was, and, um, when I got there, he was gone and, um, life was really hard and like I, I was nine and m most of my kid, my friends in school that I used to play with, um, it's either they've joined the rebel side or the military side. And when I came back, like, um, cause my uncle wasn't in town and I didn't have a place to go or a place to sleep. And, um, it was easy to, to convince me to go to the military and, um, apply to join for, for recruit. Cause, um, with that, I can get a place to stay. Um, so one of the reasons sometimes not everyone get kidnapped all the time. Uh, sometimes uh, situations happen and these kids want to eat, they want to survive, they want a place to sleep. Uh, mm -hmm. So they end up joining the military. Mm -hmm. 
And what we wanted to do is bring awareness to this and to these issues that are happening around the world. And Forming Innocence Lost Foundation was inspired by Fasciné's story. He was a child soldier in the Sierra Leone Civil War, which was a war that happened in the 90s to early 2000s in Sierra Leone. And it was um, a war between a rebel group called the RUF and the Sierra Leone government, so the Sierra Leone army that were fighting against each other for power. And a lot of children got caught up in this conflict and were used as child soldiers on both sides. Um, and so when we're talking about child soldiers, this is actually a worldwide issue. It's something that's spread all through South, um, Central and South America. There's different conflicts currently using child soldiers across Africa, in the Middle East, and in Central and South Asia. So there's many different countries. Basically, everywhere that there's a conflict happening around the world, there are ways that children get involved, and then there are ways that children are used as child soldiers. So when we formed Innocence Lost Foundation, our nonprofit mission is to build rehabilitation centers, and we want to provide education, skills training, and art and sport therapy programs for former child soldiers and war-affected youth. And we created it in 2013. We became incorporated as a nonprofit foundation. During the time um, in 2013, Fascini and I had already known each other for a couple of years. We actually met in 2011 at Vancouver Film School. We were both there taking an acting program for film and TV. And we were in different classes, um, but we were in the same program. And so I met Fascini there um, at school, and I saw a lot of what he was going through um, he had a lot of things that he was dealing with from his past, and a lot of former child soldiers have PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder. And um, I know Fascine had a lot he was going through. Fascine, do you want to tell us about your time at film school? Um, yeah, because um, when I arrived at school, film school, I was at the process. Um, I was at the time where I was starting to notice um, that I was a little bit um, different from a lot of people in the fact that um, I stayed up most night and because um, I was living in Alberta and I was working in the oil field. Um, um, like waking up in the, like waking up in the morning after two hours of sleep and going to work in the oil field and then come back home. And then when I try to go to sleep at night, sometimes I have nightmares. And then I started realizing something was really wrong with me. Cause when I was back home, um, when the war ended, um, we didn't really get educated a lot about PTSD, um, post traumatic disorder, stress disorder and how it does affect the mind. So I had no clue I was suffering from it. And when I went to film school, um, I started dealing with my past in a way I've never dealt with it before because I was right. They would make me write event um, of my past and sometimes going back there, um, bring up all this stuff. And um, when I was in school, um, I was a little bit troublesome because I was hurting and um, but I still managed to stay up and I finally found healing through school. Mm hmm. And I know um, sometimes we talk about the art therapy and how it really helped you. And so art therapy is something we really want to have at our community center that we're going to be building in Sierra Leone. And um, we're both artists and we find that art can be very healing, singing, dancing, and um, expressing yourself through acting, music, any of those types of things. So we're going to get into that and talk a little bit more about the project. Uh, in 2013, I participated in the Miss British Columbia pageant, and it was something I'd never done before. I was a little bit skeptical because because I, I thought I didn't want to participate in a beauty pageant. But I actually found out that it was um, a pageant for women to build self-esteem and um, to promote charity work and community involvement. So there was actually no beauty portion to it. Um, we didn't have to do a swimsuit competition. And everything was based on our charity work and um, our platform and self-esteem and, and um, the people that we were, our personalities. So I participated in Miss BC. And in 2013, um, after a couple of days of workshops and going together with a bunch of other amazing women, I was lucky to be crowned the title of Miss British Columbia for 2013 to 14. And it was a really amazing experience. And at the time, participating in the pageant, my platform was rehabilitation of child soldiers. And it was inspired by Fascinating Story. Because at that point, I'd known him for a couple of years. And so during then my year as Miss BC, we decided to create this nonprofit organization so that we could actually make steps towards our goals of rehabilitating child soldiers and um, um, doing something towards our goals to actually do humanitarian work. Um, 
fascinating. I'm going to pass it to you now for a little bit if you wanted to share some of your story and where you're from in Sierra Leone. So fascinating is going to tell us about his home country and how he um, came to Canada. You're listening to Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM and Make a Better World. I was born in Sierra Leone, um, which is on the west coast of Africa. Um, they've made movies about it, like Blood Diamond and uh, The Lords of War. Um, Sierra Leone has been inhabited for over 2,000 years, um, and it was founded in 1462 by a Portuguese explorer named Pedro da Center. Um, when he arrived in Sierra Leone, he thought the mountains were shaped like a lion, so he decided to call the country Serra da Loya, which means Lion Mountain um, in Portuguese. But the name was later misspelled, and it becomes Sierra Leone, which um, I really like better. <laughs> um our capital city, Freetown, was actually founded by um, black loyalists from Nova Scotia. Um, what happened was um, before the, the black loyalists from Nova Scotia arrived in Sierra Leone, there were people living in the hinterland, but there was no one living in the capital city um, where the capital city ended up being. During the American War of Independence, I'm sure most of you guys knows about um, the American War of Independence. Um, there were blacks who were fighting on the side of Britain and Britain promised them if they win the war, they would give them their liberty and they would give them land. But Britain lost the war. America gained its independence. So they decided to send some of these black loyalists and white loyalists to Nova Scotia to resettle them. But when they arrived in Nova Scotia, most of these black loyalists didn't get the land that was promised to them and they faced some hardship. So a humanitarian group decided to send some of them back to Africa to repatriate them. Uh, in 1792, they arrived off the coast of what became known as Freetown and built settlement around the city, uh, make a make a home, and then they call it Freetown as a monument for freedom. But I was born in Kabbalah, which is on the north of the the, the country. Sierra Leone gained its independence from Britain in 1961. Following independence, the country was run by corrupt government that mismanaged the country's resources. Civil servants weren't getting paid. Teachers weren't getting paid. Um, there was a lot of frustration in the country before the war started. The guy who started the war, his name was Fode Sanko. When he started the war, he promised he was going to fight for freedom, liberty, justice. He's going to bring free education for everyone and provide food for the people. Because Sierra Leone is really, really rich in diamond and other natural resources. But the thing is, because we had corrupt government that were selling all the mineral resources and storing it in banks in overseas like Norway and Sweden, um, they weren't able to do anything for the common people of the country. And when Fodi Sanko started his war, um, when he realized the war was, he was starting to lose the war, he would go to towns and kidnap a bunch of kids and take them to camp, train them and use them to go capture the next town. So the first time I was captured, it was actually by Fodi Sanko's boys. Um, his, his organization was called the RUF, Revolutionary United Front. They attacked the town I was staying at, Tonga Field. Um, my uncle escaped and I was kidnapped and then I went to camp and I did um a week training, which is mostly like dismantling an AK-47, putting it back together. And then they started using me to go capture um with the other kids to go capture more towns. But I was able to escape from them. And then later, because of circumstances and hardship, I decided to go join the army. And I stayed with the army for a little bit and then later, um, end up getting back to my, with my uncle and then he put me back to school. So during the war, I have times when I spend time studying and then there are times when I get caught up in situation and then I took part in the war. Um, when the war ended and, um, I didn't know what to do with my life and, um, it was like I was happy the war was, was over. But then um you wake up, you realize that you didn't get proper education and you don't have um financial support. You don't have a dad or a mom that was going to take care of you. Uh, and you have family to take care of, like sisters and other stuff like that. And um I found myself in this depressed uh mood. But anyway, I end up making a, a, a musical album and... um found a DJ to put it on the radio 
And um, it was political, it was anti-government, but it was more like uh, uprising, uniting the people and making making sure that people are aware of the political games and propaganda that we don't fall for it. But I was, um, after I released the album, I traveled to Canada and um, I arrived here in 2007 um, in, in Calgary. I remember when I got out of Calgary, um, it was in June and and I remember how cold I felt when I get out of the airport and um, I put on my jacket and my toque. And I remember um, the guys that came to pick me up, they're like, why are you wearing a toque? I was like, man, it's really, really cold. It's like in June, you have no idea what you're in for. And then um, winter came. Um, I remember my first winter. Um, I remember calling my work and saying I was sick and my boss was like, yeah, you're sick. We knew when it's, when you see snow, you wouldn't come to work. Mm-hmm. But I lived in the oil field and I worked in the oil field. I worked for Halliburton and other companies. Um, I got to that point when I started realizing I wasn't following my true dreams, which was more like, uh, writing music and, um, uh, pursuing, um, movies making movies and when i realized what i was doing to the planet while i was working out in the oil field um i was in that state of uh uncertainty depression so um i finally decided to go to school and i looked online for schools and vancouver film school was one of the schools that came up and i didn't even know it doesn't snow in vancouver like that until i came here and now when i found out it snows i realized well I'm going to attend school in Vancouver. So um, I attend, attended Vancouver Film School and I met Eva in Vancouver Film School and then we started the Innocence Loss Foundation. Mm-hmm. And for those of you who are just tuning in, we're talking about Innocence Loss Foundation, which is a nonprofit that Fascini and I co-founded. And um, we're going to get talking a little bit more about the project now. So in um, Sierra Leone, for our first project, we're going to be building a community center for former child soldiers um, that have been affected by the war and for the community. And um, even though the war is over in Sierra Leone, it ended in 2002, there's still a lot of people there that um, need a lot of help. There's a lot of widespread poverty. Um, in the town where we're going to be building, the illiteracy rate is up to 70%. A lot of people that can't read and write. Um, a lot of women didn't get to go to school. There's not adequate running water in the town. Um, you have to get your water from a water well, and sometimes you have to walk pretty far in order to get your water. And same thing with electricity. Um, you would only have electricity if you are wealthy and you are able to afford to own a generator. And so you may turn your generator on for a few hours, but most average people don't have electricity in their homes. And uh, were you going to say something? Yeah, um, I was just going to add to that because um, we, we're planning to open a medical clinic in our community center. And the town doesn't have a proper medical clinic right now because my sister and my mom live in the town right now. And when my mom, I mean, when my sister was sick, I had to send money for her to travel to the city. And there are a lot of people who can afford to go to the city. And uh, when they get sick... It's just uh, what happened is that they end up not getting treatment. So that's why we wanted to um, put a medical clinic on our community center. So at least we'll be able to take care of some of the problems. In for the sure. For Yeah, basic medical. Um, so, yeah, it's going to include a water well. It's going to include the medical clinic. And then we're also going to have education programs. We're going to have skills training and art and sport therapy programs for former child soldiers. So during the war, a lot of children may have missed out on their education who were fighting in the war, may not have completed their high school diplomas. So we're going to have the Sierra Leone cur- curriculum and we're going to be hiring local teachers to teach at our school on the community center. Um, and then we're going to get children who missed out on education to complete it and also children of former child soldiers who don't have the opportunity to go to school and um, for families that can't afford to send their kids to school we want to get them into our school programs so in Sierra Leone you have to pay school fees if you want your kids to go to school and if a family is poor they may only be able to scrape together enough money to send maybe one of their kids and if that happens a lot of the time they'll choose the boy if they have a son and so a lot of other kids don't um, get the opportunity and a lot of girls don't get the opportunity opportunity to go to school from poor families. So we want to get those kids into our programs. And then we're also having skills training there. So our skills training programs are going to be things that, um, that 
people can use in order to make income. So some examples, there's going to be woodworking programs, metalworking, um, construction and masonry, sewing. Um, there's going to be jewelry making, um, all different types of programs that people can, can use that are also an art and a skill, but can also then in turn help them raise, um, earn money for their families. And then also when we were talking about the art therapy programs, we have a really big focus on art and also on sports programs because we think it's really therapeutic and beneficial. So uh, when we come back, we're going to be talking with our architects from the project and they're here. They're going to tell us a little bit more about um, the, the process of creating the plans for this project that we're going to be building in Sierra Leone. Welcome back to Make a Better World on Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. Today we're talking about Innocence Lost Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization for child soldier rehabilitation. And um, getting back into what we were talking about, we now have two of our guests, which are um, Laura May and Patrick May, and they're the architects for our project. So we're going to introduce them and they're going to tell us a little bit more about the project that we're going to be doing in Sierra Leone that we're currently fundraising for. Hi, you guys. Hello. Hi, Ava. So um, thanks so much for coming today. And uh, we're just going to talk a little bit about um, how everything got started. So do you want to tell everyone who's listening how we met and how we began working together? We first met, uh, first met Ava and Fascine in the summer of 2014. At the time, I was enrolled in the photography certificate program at Langara College, where Eva and Fascine works as models for the for this photo department. Uh, one of our instructors, knowing that they were in the process of looking for an architect to help them in the design of the community center, uh, put us in contact. And so one morning I received this email from Eva saying, we're looking for an architect to design a community center in Africa. And reading further, I, I realized it was uh, our instructor, Christopher Morris from Langara College that had put us in contact. So following up, we set up a meeting and uh, Eva and Fascine came to our office. Uh, we talked for a long time about all the ideas all what the community center should be and the vision of the uh, what Lin Innocence Lost Foundation is and what the community center should be. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, uh, Patrick and I, we just look at each other and we say, yes, let's do it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, ever since, and then since we started working on, on yeah. this project. I remember that day too, Fasine and I were like, these are the people we have to work with. It was so amazing. And um, it seems like a long time ago now that we met you guys, because it seems like we've been working together with you for so long but in, in fact yeah. too it hasn't really been that long even but um, we knew for sure that you guys were the ones that we wanted to work with for this project and so Laura and Patrick they're from M3 Architecture and um, do you want to tell us a little bit about the process that you guys went through when you started creating the plans and how that all came out yeah. came about I can uh, say a few words on that um, it was two years ago. Um, it, it, it was fun, I think, when we first met you. I think it was inspiring. I think when Laura and I looked at it and we thought, oh, we can do a job in Africa. I think that was sort of like, yeah, that's a no-brainer. We'll do one of those. Um, and, and certainly the cause was uh, quite interesting. So uh, it's, a, it's the type of building and the type of institutional sort of uh, project that we've worked on most of our lives. Mm -hmm. So I think... Because it's similar to school design, and you guys have been doing that. A lot of school and community design, yeah. Mm -hmm. So And doing one in Africa was sort of like, well, that became the favorite project in the office, <laughs> without a doubt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So after that, we sort of looked at all the requirements that you guys brought to the table, the number of classrooms, the type of spaces. We talked to you guys about that a lot. You talked to us and told us what was important and what wasn't. And after that, we'd go away and we do these sketches with uh, bubbles and massings and try and come up with something that was natural that we thought would be in Africa, which we've only seen in movies, obviously. We haven't been there. But uh, so we came up with a collection of buildings, I think, that sort of grouped around sort of a theater space or a gathering space. And each of the buildings took on a different character based on sort of the requirements that uh, mm -hmm. you and Fasini sort of uh, related to us. Yeah. And so. I just want to mention, too, if any of our listeners would like to see the building plans, they're online on our website. You can go to www.innocencelostfoundation.com. And they're all up there. You can check out the work that Laura and Patrick did. 
And yeah, and I just want to add to that. Um, I remember the first time we met uh, Laura and Patrick. Like, um, as soon as we met them, we just knew right off the bat because they were really passionate and so interested, and they really wanted to do good. And um, that's what, how we want to run our foundation. Right now, we have a lot of volunteers, but we like to go more for passion. Um, you know, we want people to find healing while they volunteer, you know, helping out with us. Those are the kind of people we want to really associate with because mm-hmm. it help us, Chris, because we're dealing with a heavy subject. So it's nice to have people who are really passionate about it and just want to make the world a better place. And I and I remember when we met them, and that was like the first quality that came to my mind, and then the work they have done and before they met us and the work they did for us. It was just mind-blowing and amazing. Yeah, and I'm going to mention, too, that they did the entire project for us pro bono, so it's all just out of the kindness of their hearts. And everyone that is a part of Innocence Loss Foundation is a volunteer. Um, All of our board members, everybody that's involved is all volunteer. And that's how we run our foundation, with 100% of the money going towards the project. And uh, to cover the cost of running the organization, we have sponsors, so it doesn't get taken out of donations that people give. Um, So, Laura, did you have some else, um, other things you wanted to mention about the design concepts or anything else you wanted to talk about? Well, what made this project uh, different, uh, say, from other projects uh, is um, usually when we start a project, the first thing we do is visit the site. And because that's what informs us about the context, the local climate, community, and all the factors that influence the creation of a building. However, in this this case, uh, we were all of a sudden faced with uh, the task of designing a building in a continent we have never even been. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we knew really... At the beginning, we knew very little about the climate, the context, and the culture itself. Uh, So we started by researching online about the history and the the climate and everything. And obviously, we're asking fascinating a million questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, We were also started working with a local contact in Kabbalah, who has done a lot of research for us in terms of um, what are the available materials, the local labor, the cost of materials and labor and everything. And um, all the time we keep asking him to please take a photo of a window, a photo of a break and this and that and he's been extremely helpful and yeah it's been a fun process working from such a a great distance but somehow it's working it's coming along Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah it was very interesting from our point of view because normally we have a huge building code and a whole different set of requirements when we go about designing a building and then we get to this one and the build, there wasn't any building code other than Fasine and maybe his uncle <laughs> and, and the chief of the of the town. Uh, so from from that point of view, and then all the local building materials and the intent was everybody in the town was going to help build this. Mm-hmm. So you have to look at the whole design of the facility um, based on uh, who you can get to build it and the materials that you have. Mm-hmm. So very interesting. I mean, it was educational for us. Uh, totally. sort of go through that process so yeah it's been a big learning process for us too and um we're planning on hiring all local people to help with building and um, we're also going to have volunteers come over from different parts of the world as well but we really do want to provide jobs to the community to help with building and once we get the building set up to run the programs and all of that too very cool mm-hmm. yeah and that's definitely that's uh the, the goal i think here is to create a place that contributes to the community and uh, we want the local community to be part of the experience of building this center, and uh, not only by creating job opportunities to stimulate the local economy, but uh, to give people the opportunity to take pride in what they're building. And we would love to see people bring in their artwork and their local technologies and ideas and uh, everything uh, put together and, and have this building that is actually representative of um, of the location. Mm-hmm. Totally. Wonderful. Thank you so much, you guys. Is there anything else you wanted to add? Um, I don't 
don't think so. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much for coming in and talking with us, sharing your experience. We're so happy that we got to work with you. And um, actually, we um, Laura is a member of our board now, and Patrick is the head of our building committee. So, I mean, we've completely kept them involved in the whole process just because of how amazing it's been working with them. So, yeah, um, uh, that's the thing with um, with the world. Um, as we're talking right now, there are bad people out there conspiring to do bad, conspiring to sell weapons conspiring to start wars to make money to steal natural resources from other countries and so when you come across someone who's good and they really care about the world i think um people who want to make change in the world need to start working together we need to start really um putting um our our brains together and work out how to make this world better because um the people who are making it worse they work in 24 7 because they exploiting it so um so when we came across them and how genuine they were we decided to bring them on our team Mm -hmm. yeah and i'm really happy we did that Mm -hmm. and we enjoy it Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> yeah, it's always fun going to your office for meetings, for sure. Oh, I know. We get to shut it down and then have a talk and have some good food and uh, eat and drink. Yeah. For sure. So you're listening to Make a Better World on Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. And uh, we'll be right back. So we're here today talking about Innocence Loss Foundation. My name's Ava Vanderstar, and I'm one of the co-founders. And Fasten Keita is here as well. He's the other co-founder. And we also have Laura May and Patrick May, who are the architects that are working on our project and studio as well. If you guys just want to say hello. 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 (laughs) Hello. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about what we've been doing to fundraise and ways that people can get involved. So we talked about the project that we're doing for Sierra Leone, and it's to build a community center for former child soldiers and for helping the community heal after war, providing education, skills training, and art and sport therapy programs. And so really in 2015 was the year where we really started reaching out to the community, where we started telling people about Innocence Loss Foundation and the project that we're doing and spreading awareness about the issue. Uh, In 2015, we started speaking at schools. Um, So Fascini and I have been going into schools around the Lower Mainland, uh, mostly high schools, talking to students and some universities as well. Mm -hmm. Um, We've been educating the students about the subject and um, talking about our project and ways for people to get involved. And I know at the beginning fascinating was a little bit um yeah well um it was like um i didn't know what um the reception was gonna be um because we're talking about a dark subject and at the same time we realized it's necessary because it was on the educational purpose but before we went to school i really thought um the high school kids wouldn't be super interested in it and I was dead wrong. Um, when I went, um, I remember my first presentation because, um, you know, it, me and Eva talked about it. And I wasn't too enthusiastic, even though I knew I had to go. But when I went to the, to the high school and I found out that uh, these kids been reading books about the war in Sierra Leone and they were really, really informed. And um, they were really, really passionate about bringing change in the world. And to see um, kids who were born in Canada and raised in Canada have that kind of empathy for kids wherever in the world who are forced or find themselves in situations like that was really, really inspiring. And I'm really, it's one of um, our projects that I'm really, really proud of. And it's growing, and I'm really, really happy the way it's going and how much uh, and the youth want to volunteer and help and sometimes they put up their own fundraising they come to our event they give us ideas and Mm -hmm. that's really refreshing yeah students have been amazing with their ideas and their involvement that they want to put forth so um one of the things we started doing in schools we were creating a talent show and it's called self-express and it's a community talent show or a school-based talent show that um each school can put on and eventually it's going to be a bc-wide talent competition um for schools across bc and the 
the cool thing is, is that people here in Canada, students here in Canada can express themselves through art and um, receive like an art therapy themselves in the, in the process um, and, and raise money for building a community center to help former child soldiers. And so that has been a really cool thing. And we're starting to adopt that into more schools. So in the fall, some more schools are going to be putting on that event. And um, you can look out for that. And like Fascinating was saying, students are starting to put on their own fundraisers and creating clubs at the school. So it's been a really, really cool experience um, to see how involved and excited people are getting. And then um, some other ways that we've been fundraising, um, we do community events a lot. Um, we, we have a concert that we put on once a year, and it's called Trading a Gun for a Guitar. It happens in October, and so our first one was in October of 2015, and we raised almost $10,000 at the event, which was really amazing. We had a lot of people show up and a really good support. We had a silent auction, and we had musicians perform, so Fascinating performed, and um, a few other musicians, Jane Mortify performed. We had a band called The Spheres. Um, Debbie Bergeron performed, and um, Debbie actually wrote a song for Innocence Lost Foundation, so something that we've been putting together is we're creating a fundraising album. And so musicians have started to donate songs to Innocence Lost Foundation, and we're putting this album together, and we're going to be able to sell it as a fundraising tool coming up in the next year. So we've been very excited about that, too. So if there's any musicians listening who think that they might want to be involved in something like this and um, as a way to give back to the community and add um, their voice to our album, please do get in touch. And in the same way, too, if any teachers were listening, they'd like us to come out to their schools in the fall to present. Um, you can get in touch with us. You can check out all of that on our website. Again, that one was innocencelostfoundation.com, I-N-N-O-C-E-N-C-E-L-O-S-T-F-O-U-N-D-A-T-I-O-N.com. And so some other ways that we've been getting involved with the community, we had some yoga fundraisers that went on in last summer. Um, we've had yard sale fundraisers that we've put on. Uh, we've had an open mic night at Calabash. We also presented to Rotary Clubs, and there was a Rotary Club in Victoria that put on a fundraiser. We have individuals who've been fundraising by, um, like, doing things like um, different races or half marathons and been fundraising for us through that. Um, also, UBC put on an Urban Dash fundraiser. So it was an event where um, students created teams as if um, similar to the Amazing Race and raced around Vancouver to fundraise. So we've had lots of cool different ideas and um, lots of ways uh, to fundraise and get involved. So we're always looking for more volunteers. We're always looking for more ideas and ways to fundraise. And um, with getting our charity status pretty soon, we're going to be able to issue tax receipts to donors and we know that our fundraising will take off at that point when we're getting close to our goal of being able to go to Sierra Leone to start the community center project so please do check out our website we have Facebook uh, Twitter and Instagram where you can connect with us and um, we're always also looking for sponsors from businesses um, or corporations so the way that we run the foundation is sponsors cover the costs of everything so as we continue to grow we're going to continue looking for more businesses to come on board as sponsors as well and uh, something else that we do I wanted to mention, we have a jewelry line that we sell with all of the money going towards the project. So you can look on our website as well. We have a merchandise section. And what we do is we get together, volunteers, we all, um, we meet up every so often. We come together and we create jewelry that we then sell um, for Innocence Lost Foundation. And all of the money goes to the project. So if you're interested in getting involved with that as well. We also have a t-shirt line where we sell um, t-shirts. We have a few different designs now. It's starting to grow. We're starting to get quite a different collection of designs. And we're having people donate design ideas. So it's been really great to see all of that growing. Um, we're selling our jewelry in stores, uh, at festivals. We also are at the Peony every year in, in August, um, in the summer there. And so it's been really cool to see all the different people and different ideas coming together to fundraise for the project. Yeah, and um, I'm really, really um, uh, happy about the the, the self express project because when we had the first one at Chilliwack, um, we had um, the youngest performer was about nine years old, and then we have all the people. We have someone that was about seventy years old, and it was good to have the community in that space in the theater. Because um, um, when we went to Chilliwack, I didn't even know there would be like so many amazing acts in the town. But we were able to bring it out because we made an ad on the newspaper. So a lot of people were able to participate in that. And just having the crowd, the, the, the community together, people are meeting people for the first time. 
and um so we want to keep doing that and even when the 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 artists perform and there were like some emotional moments and we people the artists live by the name of the show which is self expressed and a lot of people express themselves through it so um yeah so back to our architect here um we've had so many foundation which you've been involved in mostly so which one is the one that you guys enjoy the most <laughs> And you've come to most of our events, mm -hmm. right? Oh, the music one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Without a doubt. Uh, guns for guitars. Yeah. Yes. Guitars yeah, for guns. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Trading a gun for guitar Trading, for sure. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. a really special night. So that's going to yeah. be coming up again this October. We, um, we're we unsure of the exact date yet, but you can keep an eye on our website event section and definitely um, put that one on your calendar when it comes up. Okay. Yeah. When is uh, Fazanay putting out his album? Oh, yes. Fascinating. I'm going to talk a little bit about your personal album and also your book. Yeah. Um, I'm writing a book about growing up in Sierra Leone, my experiences and all that. Um, there is a school in Chilliwack that I've um, read a chapter or two of my book in class. Um, it's a work in progress. Um, and uh, my um, recording album too and i'm i'm not sure yet when it's gonna come out but um let's hope it's pretty soon because um i would like to get it out pretty soon yeah, yeah. We, we've been waiting a while <laughs> <laughs> it's a just saying <laughs> <laughs> yes and um the cool thing is that we've had so many people that have given us their wonderful support and and shown us and it is a big process um creating a foundation from scratch and creating a project and and fundraising and setting out to do it but it's been amazing the amount of support that we've received starting off with friends and family and then branching out and um, meeting more people and so many people that we meet that are just these amazing people that have lent their support and and to help um, get us closer and closer to our mm -hmm. goals. And it's really become a, commu a community effort, and we're creating a movement. So it's been a wonderful experience, and um, I wouldn't change it for the world. It's been yeah, a lot of work, yeah, yeah. but it's also been a wonderful experience to start this and to work towards our goals. And we run our foundation really, really transparently. And um, when we work with people, it's not like we come in and being like, oh, this is how we want to do it. Because uh, we found the best way to work with people is to let them put their input on it. And then you put your input on it. And then you put all the inputs on the table. And then you find what works the best. And maybe sometimes you got to mix the ideas. And sometimes you choose another idea. Mm -hmm. So um, we want to continue with that because um, I know everyone has have something to give but um sometimes we get caught up we're like oh i have this i have this um we we don't listen to other people we don't learn from them uh, which limit our growth so we don't run the foundation like that that's one thing we want to stay away from we want everyone to be an equal contributor and we want to work together and figure out what works the best Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we invite you. If you have idea, um, don't hesitate. This is a family. It's a movement. It's an awareness um, movement. So be involved. Mm -hmm. So um, thanks so much again. You're listening to Make a Better World. You can check out all of our information online, innocencelostfoundation.com. Um, on Twitter, we're at foundation underscore IL. We have our Instagram at Innocence Lost Foundation. You can also find us on Facebook and a bunch of other different social media platforms. And um, our guests today were Laura and Patrick May from M3 Architecture, and they also have a website. And what is your guys' website? m3architecture.ca wonderful so you can also check out their amazing work and we have the building plans that they've created for us up on our website as well thank you so much for tuning in and we hope that if this touched you in any way that you reach out to us and um, let us know and if you want to be involved we're always open to having more people join the team so thank you